Hey, what's up everybody? This is Sean and I am super stoked to be here with my new educator, Hunter. What's up, buddy? Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you here. So uh, we are broadcasting not only to Facebook, we're broadcasting to YouTube, we're broadcasting to the website, um, and uh, we're, we're going to have an awesome lecture uh, here today. I got somebody tuning in from Orlando. Hey, what's up from Orlando in the house? Hey, guys, thanks for joining the broadcast. It's super cool to have you here. Um, just like uh, this, if you want to leave your comments in the comments below, they will pop up and I can add them to the broadcast. And then we can uh, kind of recognize you and answer your questions. So super stoked to have everybody here today. I'm seeing some people come into the uh, the broadcast in uh, Facebook right now, so I'll be kind of monitoring the, um, uh, oh, Raphael uh, from Orlando. Cool. Raphael, it did not actually allow me to put your name in, but I can see you over here in the uh, Flightcrate group. So um, there is, here, I'm going to actually see if I can find, pull this up right now. I put a link in a, whoa, I put a, whoa. I put a link in a previous broadcast, and so I'm going to try and copy and paste that actually into this broadcast because if anybody is wanting to um, uh, comment during the broadcast and actually have your name and all that pop up just like um, just like I did uh, a minute ago, you will be uh, able to do that. Um, I'll work on that while Hunter is uh, doing his deal. So. Anyways, happy EMS week to everybody. Super stoked uh, about that, right? We get to celebrate us, you guys, once a year <laughs> for about a week, right? And Hunter, you know, being a nurse, he gets nurses week and EMS week now that he's flying. So lucky you. <laughs> to all of you oh, nurses God. out there in in uh, in the Flight Creek community, thank you for being a part of our community as well. And we'll just kind of, live vicariously through you during EMS week or during nurses week. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, with that, uh, I do have a, a special offer for everybody who is watching the broadcast. So stick around till the end of the broadcast. Um, as my way of saying happy EMS week to everybody, I'm going to have an offer for you at the very end. Um, and so stick around all the way to the end and then, um, we'll have some other stuff throughout the week as well, just to say thanks to everybody. Um, so with that, Hunter, RN, BSN, CFRN, I'm super glad to, to have this opportunity to do this broadcast with you. And um, yeah. for those of you who, well, he's new to the Flight Crit team. He's, one of, he's our newest educator. And fortunately for me, I get to work with him um, you know, every single week because we work together. So that's super cool. Uh, he's one of my regular mm -hmm. partners and I'm thoroughly enjoying learning so much. So today, Hunter, yeah, uh, you're going to go over external ventricular drains. Correct. Yep. So that's uh, yeah, I, uh, my background before flying was in the uh, traumatic uh, burn intensive care unit. So we had quite a bit of EVD. So I was uh, pretty familiar with them. Um, I did this lecture at a critical care conference for paramedics not too long ago. Um, it seemed to go over pretty well there. So we'll just keep this light. It should only be about 20 ish minutes. And then uh, if you have any questions after you let me know, uh, I think it's always good to get a refresher on EVDs. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think we fly them every day, but when you do fly them, uh, it's just good to have a nice little refresher on them. So, yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I totally agree. I'll tell you, you know, I've been flying for 12 years now. I've never flown an EVD. Um, and, um, but, <laughs> you know, it's not to say that I wouldn't. Um, usually, <laughs> obviously, we're taking them from, you know, an outer line, you know, care facility back to a tertiary care facility. But, you know... Medicine is advancing, and it would not surprise me if at some point, um, you know, I we would we will start flying these, and so knowing how right. to at least have a familiarity with them, so that when we look right. at that and somebody's got you know a hole drilled in their head, we don't freak out and go, oh my gosh, like <laughs> what am I going to do with this? And understanding like you know you know how to zero them and how to like how to adjust the the drain so we don't collapse their ventricles and all that kind of stuff. So. Not only that, I think it's really important for those of us in, or for those in our community to have a broader understanding of the knowledge beyond just transport medicine, right? Because 
that makes you a well-rounded educator or a well-rounded clinician, right? Where you really understand the medicine, the, the ICU level medicine that goes into managing these, these patients. Right. So cool. Super stoked about that. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you. Let's see here. Let me Alrighty. bring this up and so I will let me go ahead and add. Ooh. Give me a minute, everyone. Oh. Sorry about that. Let's see here. Oh, 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 that was my fault. Bear with me, everybody. Here we go. And we are going to. All right, Hunter, you are you are up. Screen is up. Yes, sir. Are you ready to rock and roll? Yeah, let's do it. All right, guys. So just quick, we're just going to go through some basic anatomy and phys. Um, I love it. I think it's always good to kind of have a nice little uh, understanding of it. It makes these EVDs way easier. Um, so obviously we have the skull going through the meningeal layers, which are the coverings of the brain here. First and foremost, you know you have the pia matter. And then we have the arachnoid. And this is most important for us because of the subarachnoid space. If you guys remember, the subarachnoid space is where the CSF likes to live. Uh, it circulates throughout that space. And that's where the bridging between the CSF into the blood system actually exists. Um, so it's a big deal when we have people with subarachnoid hemorrhages, secondary to trauma or aneurysms, anything like that. If you put blood in this um, area, obviously we're going to have some issues with the buildup of CSF. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that later. Um, we have the dura matter. Remember, that's that nice strong one. That's why we kind of get that. Um, you know, with epidurals and subdurals, we can have different kind of injuries there. And then we have the subdural space. Okay. So like I said, just a basic overview, nothing huge. Everyone here um, understands this stuff, but we'll just run through it. As far as cerebral spinal fluid goes. So remember guys, CSF, it's usually clear in nature. Um, it helps to protect the brain and the spinal cord, helps with neural signaling and a lot of other stuff that we don't really have to get into today. But the basic thing is it's a cushion within the brain and it protects the brain. That big word there, this, those choroid plexuses, they're found actually in the wall of those ventricles and they make it. So if you look at your ventricles, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but it's this beautiful highway that comes out, goes around, circles the brain, circles the spinal cord, and then this portion on top, which I, Zoom in over here is how we get CSF into the blood system. So as far as ventricles, there's four total ventricles. We have these two lateral ventricles. Those are those nice C-shaped ventricles, okay? Those are our two big ones here. This is actually where we're gonna place the EBD, okay? Because it's like X marks the spot, look how big that target is. So it's usually in that right lateral ventricle, or that lateral horn shape over here. It's usually where we put that. Then we go into our third and then our fourth ventricle. And then we circulate in that subarachnoid space, which we talked about, and we protect and do what we need to do. And then we get reabsorbed into the blood. We get reabsorbed into the blood by these projections. If this is your subarachnoid space here, these projections into this dural sinus, venous dural sinus right here, are called the arachnoid granulations or arachnoid villi. Okay. Hey, so Hunter. Yeah. Hey, so just real quick, so we're not seeing the pointer show up on the screen. So, oh, okay. Um, so just so you're aware of that, uh, we can um, just kind of like verbalize, you know, what what it is that you're pointing to. We'll, we'll work on getting getting uh, that kind of added in um, as we kind of work through the broadcast. Okay. Can you see why I do this? Uh, what do you? I just drew on the screen. Maybe you can't see that. Yes, Darn it. that okay. we see. Yes. Oh, okay. So again, over here, those are those arachnoid granulations. And you can see the CSF goes into those little projections and then goes into that blue area, which is the blood system, and then goes out. Um, so... Uh, obviously, guys, if you watch this, this is a perfect highway. So if we mess that up, let's say we get blood in the intracerebral space like here, that can obviously mess that up. If we get bleeding into that subarachnoid space like this, that obviously can cause issues getting the CSF out. Um, so that would be a good example of hydrocephalus. Or if we have swelling from a tumor, TBI, anything like that, pushes on that system, obviously you can see how fast we can accumulate CSF. <clears throat> so now... Your patient has high ICPs and you want to do a drain, so let's talk about it. So the EVD drain itself, 
some reasons why we would you would see it placed hydrocephalus whether that's um, traumatic or non-traumatic um, if you have infected CSF when you have meningitis or something like that and you want to get that out um, bleeds sometimes you just want to release the blood so uh, intraventricular hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage um, or just swelling in general so remember the EVD has two purposes one it can drain things so if we need to make more space we can drain off CSF we can drain off blood but we can also measure ICP so sometimes they're, they're placed if a patient has a low GCS and maybe your CT scan looks clean or clear and you don't know maybe you have a diffuse axonal injury or something we'll place an EVD that way we can get real-time measuring of their ICP we have actually a number to treat you know, it's hard in the field when you're just treating a TBI because you assume it's a TBI. At least with an ICP measurement, now we have a number to treat, just like you would with a blood pressure or anything like that. Um, so kind of what I was talking about there, the CSF flows very well, but once the ICPs get high, the brain has an issue doing that autoregulation. So we enter a drain to help get it off. As you can see, he's holding the catheter. It's a nice, flexible piece of plastic. He'll put it usually in the right uh, lateral horn that we talked about, that C-shaped lateral ventricle, and it goes about six centimeters into that area, okay? Um, <clears throat> as you can see on the left, guys, on that picture, I think it's on your left, that's how your um, drain should look. Uh, obviously, there's usually going to be a tegaderm over that, but I just wanted you to see they will staple that into the head, and that's kind of that nice-looking... Um, uh, insertion site that you should see there. <clears throat> Again, we can put EVDs in at the bedside. That's usually where we're going to see them in the transport environment. Um, if anyone here is in the ICU or ER, um, you can see them done in the ICU at the bedside, at the ER, or sometimes they'll put them in in the OR, depending on how emergent they are. Um, anyways, it's usually a pretty quick procedure. I'm sure um, some people here have seen them. Um, usually, sometimes your patient is awake for them. Sometimes they're intubated. just depends on their level of consciousness. Um, if they're awake, uh, usually they get some local anesthetic, and then they're going to get some kind of medication to help relax them um, because, yes, you are drilling into their head, so it is uh, uncomfortable for someone that's awake. Yeah, I'll tell you, Hunter, I, I did see them place this one time at the bedside on an awake patient um, in the ICU, and it was the first time I had seen that. It was crazy to actually watch them, you know, bore into their skull <laughs> and place this yeah. on an awake patient. So um, it's amazing what they can do. It is. Yeah, it really is. It's, uh, yeah, I've, I've had, I had someone that had an aneurysm and they were still with it enough, but um, just to explain to them what was going to happen, it's, it's, it's pretty grueling. So. That's right. Um, so now we'll kind of talk about the system itself. So measuring the EVD, <clears throat> we like to do that at the foramen of Monroe, which is hard for us to see because we can't see into the brain, but that's where the third and lateral ventricle meet. Well, we just say measure at the tragus because if you look at anatomy, the tragus actually measures up very well with that area. So the first thing you always want to do is make sure you're level, just like you would with an A-line, just like you would with anything else. Um, you try and do it as best as you can if you're a transport nurse or trying to get into transport. You can see how difficult this would be in an aircraft, uh, especially a rotor wing versus a fixed wing or um, a ground transport. Um, so you do your best, but the first thing you want to do is make sure you're measuring it. So as you can see in this video, he just uses the actual drainage tubing or the tubing from the system itself to measure. Um, I've seen everything, you know, some people use um, a tape measure, some people use just rope if they have it or any kind of string, or I've just sent some people just eye it. Um, but like I said, I think it's easiest just to use the tubing like he's doing here and just make sure you're level. <clears throat> Next, uh, we'll kind of go through the management and we'll kind of continue the management of the system itself. So first and foremost, the actual measurement device here. So always make sure that you have the right measurement device before you leave the bedside, or if you're measuring them in the hospital, always make sure that you have the correct measurement. Um, <clears throat> these are universal a lot of times nowadays that they can be used for lumbar drains, they can be used for a lot of other things. So um, if you um, if you see here at the top, which you guys, I guess, can't see with my corner, but you can turn this knob and have a lot of different measurement types. 
So uh, always want to know where you want to measure and how much. So usually it's millimeters of water um, or centimeters of water, excuse me. And remember that the number you're setting, it will only drain over that number. So what I mean there is if you set your ICP to 10, like on the screen here, your measurement to 10, it'll only drain over 10 when the ICP, ICP gets, ICP gets, to, gets to 10. See if this is a fresh trauma or someone that starts to swell, usually it's about that 24 hours when you see really big swelling going on, they might start at the higher number like 20 because they know their ICPs are already gonna be high and they don't wanna drain in excess. As your patient gets better in the ICU, you'll see them come down on that number because they should be able to auto-regulate themselves and not need our help as much as far as the um, ICPs go. Um, the other thing here I have now circled is the uh, the kind of the clamp that's closest to your patient. Usually we'll have these two yellow sides on it so you know that it's a EVD drain, it's not a central line, it's not a peripheral IV. The biggest thing is you always wanna make sure that's open if you're ordered to keep it open. Um, there are times that it's appropriate to clamp. Obviously, just like a chest tube, be very careful clamping these, making sure you're doing it for a very small amount of time. If you're laying a patient flat or anything like that, that you're worried that if they dump a bunch of CSF, you can go ahead and clamp it if you at all need to, but always making sure that you're unclamping it um, as long as you're ordered to. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about the actual transducer, which I have circled here. Um, the transducer itself is just like an A-line transducer. They're all kind of universal at this point. But this is how you're going to zero and how you're going to measure. So when we're zeroing here, um, this video will kind of demonstrate what I'm saying. We always want to turn it up or towards your patient, OK? So if we turn it up, you follow your line. That line should go back towards the patient's head. That will make sure it's shut off to the patient so we don't have any measurement uh, interruptions there. And that all we're working with is the actual system itself. You'll turn down your measurement vice down to zero and then you'll zero it on your monitor. So like I said, the biggest thing you guys wanna make sure is that your level first and we zero, then we can get an ICP measurement. Um, so, Anytime you're going to move the patients, anything like that, you have to re-zero, which becomes pretty cumbersome if you're in the transport environment because we're moving these guys a lot. So I kind of wait until I'm – the times I've uh, transported these, I kind of waited until I was in the aircraft. Um, obviously, it's pretty hard to do, but you do as best as you can. Uh, but again, you'll make sure that it's measured at that tragus. Again, you guys bring it down to zero and then zero on your monitor. <clears throat> Then next, we can actually measure an ICP number. Um, the EVDs themselves are, mm, there's other devices where you can get a measurement of ICP and drain at the same time. However, the EVD, this exact um, measuring device, you can only do one or the other, uh, not simultaneously. So remember, if you want to measure ICPs, that uh, actually makes you turn it off. So you'll turn it um, down. So you'll leave it um, open to the patient, but close off to the system. But remember, as you're getting ICP number, you cannot drain simultaneously. Um, so just remember to open that back up to keep that highway open and allow CSF to drain off. Um, as we kind of talk about drainage next uh, quickly, just remember uh, to ask how much. Usually at the bedside, the doc will be there and you can just say, hey, how much would you like? I mean, if you're a transport nurse, you're only gonna have them for about an hour anyways. Um, sometimes I've had them order, don't do any drainage. Sometimes they're like, nope, I don't, don't drain anything off. You know, maybe sometimes they just put it in just to manage ICPs. Sometimes they don't feel that they really need a lot drained off. Maybe in that first 24 hours, once they start to swell out quite a bit, maybe then they will order it. Um, but just know, I, I don't want to give a number because everywhere is different, but there is a certain number of CSF you want to drain off each hour. And the goal is to drain off enough to help reduce swelling. Yes, and there always are complications of draining off too much. Um, so you just kind of want that right number. This yellow uh, device here is what is actually allowing the CSF to drain off. So you'll turn that open so, so you can drain off fluid into the collection bay. And then always make sure to shut it back off. I've worked in the ICU before where um, one hour someone's like, oh, they didn't drain anything. And then they notice they left that yellow stopcock open, uh, which can happen to anyone. So just make sure you're closing that back off. The collection bag is always nice. You can see how your CSF, CSF looks. 
Again, it usually looks clear, but remember, if you have bleeding in that interventricular area, in the subarachnoid area, and you have that mixing of blood and CSF, it might look a little pink tinge. It might look like blood. Maybe you're just draining off blood at this point uh, with a little bit of CSF, or it might look kind of cloudy if you have someone that has an infection uh, within the central nervous system. Um, that might be also um, something to look at. Hey, Hunter, I, I want to take a quick, quick pause here to see if there's any questions from the, the community. And, and while uh, we're waiting for any questions to potentially come in, I wanted to ask you, um, are there moments, whether it's in the ICU or whether it is um, in, the, in transport, where um, you have had, a, had to do an emergent um, drain you know, where you've released a certain number of uh, you know, cc's of CSF in order to emergently manage somebody's uh, ICP, somebody who's exhibiting signs of, of elevated ICP, Cushing's, you know, in addition to all your other therapies. Although I, I would imagine if you've got an EVD drain in, you're not going to be likely to be giving things like hypertonic or mannitol, things of that nature. You would just drain CSF, right? So do you have any kind of, you know, kind of input or insight on, on that how you might use the drain in that kind of a situation? Sure, yeah. So the the times I've had drains placed in a truly emergent, emergent situations where the patient is uh, presenting bradycardic, uh, their GCS is um, <clears throat> going down pretty quickly. I mean, I've always been at a tertiary care center where I have a neurosurgeon. So uh, I, I haven't per se seen a burr hole just placed. Um, I, I know they'll place them in the OR sometimes, but usually if I already have the surgeon, they'll just place the EVD so we can automatically drain off that CSF. Um, but we still do the uh, th other therapies you're talking about, the 3% bolus or 2% drip, um, hot salts being 23% um, or sometimes uh, mannitol. Uh, those therapies are still, I think, helpful. Um, I can't speak to um, what everyone else does. Uh, but like I said, usually if we have them at the bedside, they will just place the EVD so we can get a, a way to measure the ICP. Again, we need a number to treat and then be able to drain off the CSF as well, and then still keeping those therapies um, uh, nearby. Um, some people's ICPs, even with the EVD, are still spiking super high. Um, and I, the, the farthest I've seen is um, someone going into like a barbiturate coma or something like that, where we completely put them under um, for a certain amount of weeks and, and then wake them up in a couple of weeks to try and totally uh, suppress and then they have an EEG and everything like that hooked up. But yeah, even sometimes with the EVD, their brain will still fight through it and they'll have huge IC, ICP spikes. So. Perfect. <clears throat> One other question I wanted to ask you about the, the picture that we see on, on, the, uh, on the screen right now, right? So you've got the drain yeah. bag, but then you also have the mm -hmm. collection can, uh, um, uh, vial or tube above the, the yellow stopcock. So if that yellow stopcock is closed to the drain bag, will and, and the and the... EVD is still open to the patient, um, mm -hmm. will it still drain and collect in that upper chamber? Um, yep. And just not drop down into the, uh, into the lower bag is I kind of envision it almost like a, you know, like a, um, like a Foley, right. Where you've got the, the measuring canister and then you've got the bag, the re bag reservoir that you dump into. So right. kind of how this system works. Right, exactly. So the chamber itself is so you can um, know how much you're just draining for the hour because the chamber itself will have the actual numbers on it as far as CCs. So that's how you're keeping on because the collection bag, once you dump it in there, it's impossible to know how much is in there. So right. the chamber itself is how you hour per hour know how much you're draining right. and then you get that out of there so you can restart your measurement the next hour. Cool. Um, I, I would have some neurosurgeons that I would call and say, hey, you know, they only drained, you know, maybe they drained 25 cc's this hour. They drained a lot, maybe more than they wanted. Empty that out and then let's check again next hour. And if they continue, then we'll talk. But at least what you do is you reset that, then turn it off and then see how much you've drained um, the next hour and see if it's becoming an issue. So Perfect. That's awesome. Cool. And uh, we got a couple yeah. of people who have kind of finally made their way into the into the broadcast. Richard, glad glad you made it over from the from the page to the group. Um, this the we'll, we're going to leave this broadcast up um, for for the next hour after it completes, so you can go back and watch the, the the initial portion of the broadcast that you may have missed. Cool, Hunter. That's um, those are the questions that I have. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions from the group right now, so go ahead and continue with your presentation.
Alrighty. So last but not least, guys, we're going to talk about waveforms. So ICP waveforms, um, I think, are, are kind of a, a, a tricky thing to uh, watch. I think it takes a very good neurosurgeon to know what they're looking at. I've seen some pretty good ones, but I've also looked at some and been like, that's not how the textbook looks. So we call these P waves or peak waves is what ICP waveforms are. So there's three P waves for each cardiac cycle in a normal compliant um, brain. So if you can see here, we have P1, P2, P3. Um, so it kind of should look like a staircase. If you have someone that has what we call compliant, that's a brain that is dealing with any kind of changes in pressures well, and their P waves march out just like that. So that's a nice compliant waveform. When they start to peak, become non-compliant, you'll see P2 kind of spike, and I think it kind of looks like a crown. Uh, if you ever look up these pictures after the broadcast, go ahead and uh, check it out. But uh, it'll go P1, P2, P3, and that again will be a non-compliant brain. There is so much, if you want to nerd out and just go YouTube all this stuff, you can. I'm just trying to keep it on a nice surface level uh, because it, it's way more dynamic than what I'm saying. I just want you to be able to kind of look and notice, oh, that that's a brain that looks compliant. Or if you see these waveforms, you're like, hey, maybe we should check his ICP because that looks like a non-compliant brain. There are certain waves, too, that you should be aware of that are um, very detrimental to the patient. So as you can see here, um, if you look down at the graph, you have your nice kind of ICP waveforms. And again, those are beat per beat. So you'll see them just like an A wave or an A line. Those are beat per beat. You'll see the same thing with these ICP waveforms. Now, B waves are called A waves. And I say A waves are awful. A waves are awful. As you can see on the left, these guys are peaking out at about an ICP of 60. And if you look on the bottom, okay, your time is over 15 minutes. So you can see how long it takes for that ICP to come back towards physiologic or towards whatever baseline they were at, and then they'll peak up again. So these have very large peaks and a very long time for that ICP to get back to normal. So these are over a long period of time. B waves, I always say, are bad. They're, as you can see, they're still spiking, um, but you're coming down to a normal physiologic baseline a lot faster. Now, just to let you know, um, I've never seen these, but it's always good if you kind of see these huge spikes um, to tell your neurosurgeon, hey, I maybe saw, you know, you don't have to call them A wave or B wave or anything, but if you say, you know, I saw dramatic changes in their ICP and it took a long time for it to come back to normal, it's something they're going to watch. I kind of tell people it's like having a run of VTAP or something like that or frequent PVCs that you're worried are going to turn into something. There's something they're going to monitor and keep watching. Last but not least, are C waves. These are probably the least worst, but I think these are probably more common to see. Um, you can see as your um, P waves or your ICP waves are going about normal. Uh, the C waves will still kind of pipe, spike up the ICP, um, but they come down very, very fast and they're not as bad. And that's about all I have for you guys. Sorry, I was a little over 20 minutes, but that was uh, that was about all I had for you. No, Hunter, that, that was awesome. Um, I do have uh, one, uh, one, a couple comments here. So, um, so Richard asks, uh, any tips on how to secure the setup in a helicopter? Uh, I don't know if you've been you... moving in a, a helicopter or, or fixed wing before, uh, but uh, you know, any comment on that? Yeah, so it depends. Uh, when I was in a fixed wing aircraft, there was there's uh, some of them have IV poles um, connected to your pram or your stretcher. You can always use that. Um, sometimes it's just kind of MacGyvering, like a lot of stuff, I guess, in transport medicine. If you figure out a good way to do it, I'd love to know. Um, I guess it depends how big your aircraft is and what you have available. Um, but I don't have a, a great way. Uh, again, I've only uh, transported a couple of these and. Um, I think as I do more, maybe I could find other ways, but um, I don't have exactly a great idea if you don't have a pole or something like that. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's not like, you know, doing an A-line where you can you can tape the transducer to the patient's arm. You know, I guess potentially you right. could tape it to the side of their head, you know, and then, right. then at least the transducer is set at the right level. That's not going to necessarily be sufficient for your drain. Um but right. I, I imagine, you know, at least that way you could be transducing and getting a pressure. And then if for whatever reason, the pressure 
um, spiked, you you know, and you and you had orders to to drain. I guess you could, in theory, hold the drain at the proper level, right, and then drain a little bit, and then turn it off, so it's not draining anymore. I mean, is that reasonable? Yeah, I think that is. Um, sometimes people have carabiners too on top of the aircraft. You could always hang it from there. Now, just keep in mind, I mean, it's transport medicine, so you're not going to have the best waveforms or anything, but this patient's being emergently transported for a reason. So at the very least, what you can do is drain off CSF if you're ordered to do that, which is ultimately what that patient needs sometimes. But your measurements and your waveforms might not be the best in the back of a rumbling aircraft. <laughs> right, yeah. No, totally, totally, totally agree with that. That's cool. You know, as, as like you said, you know, in transport medicine, we do the best we can, right? You know, and, right. and it really is going to depend on what aircraft you're in. I mean, if you're flying an H-125, like we are, you've got no room to do anything. If you're flying in you know, a Goose 169 or, four, you know, 145, you got all the room in the world. So, you know, and yeah. then, of course, you throw in, you know, if you're, if you're transporting somebody in a uh, fixed wing, then that's a whole different story as well. Right. Right. So, right. You're going to do the best you can. Um, anything. <laughs> it's never ideal. It's never ideal. Yeah. Um, Raphael, uh, Raphael asks the question, um, uh, what do you refer to as a compliant brain? So um, I think I understand the questions. I think what he's saying, you know, right, is, is when you say the word compliant brain, what does that mean? And, you know, sure. what that means to me is that a, bl a brain – that is not completely swollen to the point where it's it's completely filled the cranial vault and it has no stretch to it, right? But you right. Know, maybe you can add to that. Yeah, no, exactly what you said. <clears throat> so a compliant brain is a brain that's, you know, all of us are sitting with low ICPs right now, but if you go work out or you do something to increase your ICPs, you have the ability to do auto regulation. So whether that's your brain's going to increase its blood pressure or decrease its blood pressure, whatever it's going to do to uh, constrict and dilate those vessels to create more space or dump off more CSF into the blood to create more space for those uh, small interruptions and increase ICP. It's compliant. When we look at a non-compliant brain that has swelling um, <clears throat> or it has blood that's within that system, it cannot do that as well. Um, so you're going to see that waveform I was talking about. It just gives you an idea that that brain cannot auto-regulate. It can't constrict, dilate its blood vessels. It can't maybe offset CSF as well. Um, it's just non-compliant. Right, right, yeah. And, right, you know, just like in arterial, right, you know, the heart beats, it sends that, that waveform that we feel as a radial pulse. The brain does the same thing, right? So the heart beats, the, the you know, blood flow to the brain, and it creates this bouncing effect, right? And we've all learned about the Monroe Kelly doctrine, right? Where you have brain, you've got blood, and you've got CSF, and they have to, you know, they have to shift the volumes, right? A little bit of blood goes out, a little bit of CSF goes out because the brain, you know, hopefully is not going out, right? And so as the pressure goes up, either blood has to be, uh, you know, um, removed from the uh, from the um, the cranial vault or CSF, right? And eventually, and I don't remember, maybe you remember, but there is an upper limit at which point the brain loses the ability to auto-regulate it. It's some really high yeah. CSF or ICP level, right? And so then all of a sudden they lose that ability. Um, uh, da, 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 yeah. Um, so cool. Yeah, Raphael says, awesome. That makes sense. Uh, I have another question here um, from Ryan and I can't share this one to the group, but he says, any concerns for air pressure inside the collection chamber while at altitude, right? Um, mm. right? It's not a closed container, is it? Or, or, or maybe it is, right? You know, because we know, you know, Boyle's Law, things expand. Right, right. <clears throat> so I guess with that, just with an A-line, um, you know, re-zeroing once you get to <clears throat> altitude, wherever that is. Um, I mean, in a fixed wing, in theory, it's a pressurized aircraft. You don't have to worry as much. Depending on what you're flying, um, uh, if you're flying at higher altitudes out in the mountains or something like that, that's definitely something maybe you'd want to think about re-zeroing that uh, chamber. But I, I guess I'd never really thought um, how that would affect drainage, um, if it would. Um, from my experience, I didn't have any. Granted, I was maybe flying about 2,000 AGL or above ground, um, but... That's a that's a good question. That's something I would have to look into myself. Um, but I do agree that re-zeroing that transducer is not a bad idea, just like you would with your other pressure uh, 
uh, waveforms once you get up to altitude, depending on how high you're flying. Yeah, right. And and you know, you know, we always talk about you know like hydrocephalus or uh, or pneumocephalus, right? And that air expanding you know, within the cranial vault. There's not a whole lot we can do about that. You know, um, you, I think the question is specifically in the chamber. Um, you know, and if you're if you're monitoring the patient, then the, the your stopcock is going to be off to the chamber. So <clears throat> any kind of air expansion within the chamber is not necessarily going to affect the patient, right? Because right. you know you're, you're, it's between it's between the your your monitor and the patient. So obviously when the when the surgeon places these, they're going to make sure that they do a, a full flush um, uh, of the of the line of the system, so that there shouldn't be any air within the actual drain itself the drain catheter between the the skull and the transducer right and the icp you know it according it it should be um relatively level enough being that it's zero down there to push that fluid through so that line's usually you know all fluid through so i don't think i don't i i didn't have issues with enough pressure in that chamber to push up on the fluid so it would not drain it so drains just uh, as well right yeah and likewise right remember like you know if, if we've got a transducer you know for you know an a-line it's on a pressure bag but these are not sure. we do not have a pressure bag on these we are not putting fluid yeah. into the patient's brain so we don't run the yeah. risk of like you know air in in our in our bag of saline or whatever you know you know, expanding and putting you know fluid into the brain so uh ryan i hope that answers your question thank you for the question and what we, what we will do is we'll just kind of do a little bit more uh research on our end to make sure that um that there's not some like small minutia you know detail that we're missing with regards to air in the system um at altitude um and we'll we'll share that to the group so for those of you who are um who are in the group um you'll you'll get that answer so it's super cool um awesome Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. No, I, I think it's uh, it's pretty. Uh, I wouldn't say foreign, but it doesn't happen quite often in the pre-hospital environment. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with Sean. We'll we'll go in and look into that more. Um, I would be curious about that last question as well. So yeah, yeah. cool. Right on. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't have anything else to add. And remember, you know, like like I was saying, you know, I, I've never flown one of these in a helicopter. Um, I'm sure somebody out there has. Um, so if any of you out there in the community have flown one of these um, and have anything to add kind of to the uh, to the conversation, please put it in the comment section below and, and we'll share that out to the whole group. Um, I don't have anything else. So for those of you who um, have tuned in to the end, first of all, thank you very much. Welcome, Hunter, to, uh, to the FlightGrid team. Super stoked to have hey. you. Um, happy EMS week to everybody. I'm going to head, I'm going to put a link here in the, uh, in the comment section, uh, in the group. Um, and I'm also going to put it up. Um, I'm going to share it to the broadcast for those of you who are watching this in the medic lab, um, over on the website, uh, or in YouTube. Um, it is for the next hour. Um, we're going to run uh, a special, we're going to be running specials all week long for EMS week. Um, but for those of you who are inter interested, um, we have a special running uh, running right now. If you join the Medic Lab, and if you're not familiar with the Medic Lab, you can find out some more information about it over at flightgrit.com forward slash the Medic Lab. But what it is is this is our um, this is our uh, membership community where uh, we're going to be doing broadcasts like this uh, at least twice a week, um, and then once a month we're going to be doing like a group mentoring program. Um, you will have access to all of the um, the lessons um, in the medic lab for continuing education. So right now, um, there's not a much, not a whole lot in there. But over the next two weeks, I'm going to be taking um, all of the lessons that I've been doing over the last several weeks. I'm going to be chunking them up into uh, individual lessons and putting them into the medic lab. You will be able to go through those lessons and be able to get continuing education for each one. And then as we do more broadcasts like this, the broadcast will be um, saved and put in the Medic Lab where you will also be able to go and get continuing education. So for this one, you'll be able to get um, you know, 30 or half an hour uh, of continuing education. There's going to be a small quiz. Um, the regular price for the Medic Lab is $19.97 per month. 
for all that content. <clears throat> but for the for EMS week, we're going to uh, we're dropping the price down to nine dollars ninety seven cents a month. If you join, um, you'll have that for as long as you're a member of the uh, community. Um, in addition to that, for those of you who have watched this broadcast right now, if you join the Medic Lab. Um, you will also get access to the Epic Review course um, as part of your uh, part of your bundle. So that'll be automatically included. You'll get access to the Epic Review course for a year. If you are already a member of the Epic Review course, um, you will get an additional year added to your current membership. So that offer is going to um, last for the next hour. And I'm going to go ahead and put a link um, in the broadcast, and I will share it out right on right now. So I just put a link in the, um, the uh, comment section um, within uh, the Flight Crit group and I'm going to put it up right here. Um, and I will also email that out to everybody so you don't have to necessarily grab it right now. Um, so for the next hour, if you want to, you can, um, you can join the Medic Lab. You'll, have, um, you'll get that continuing education. And you'll also be able to uh, get the Epic Review course, which is our 32-hour uh, uh, FPC CCPC review course. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments section. And uh, we will definitely respond to those comments um, uh, and make sure that we answer all your questions. Uh, I have nothing else. If you have nothing else, um, Hunter, we'll just say thanks, everybody, for joining. It was a pleasure. Yeah, nothing else. Thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate you guys being with us this uh, Monday morning. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, everybody, happy EMS week. Thank you very much. Um, stay tuned. We're going to be doing more broadcasts like this um, uh, each week uh, going forward. So that's all I have. You guys have a great day and uh, happy EMS week. And we'll talk to everybody soon. See ya. Thanks, guys.